Be gone, vile man! Be gone from me! The Wrestling Life. Hey everybody, it's The Wrestling Life. It's episode 375. We're at the end of May of 2024. I'm Ethan. And I'm Liam. Liam, we have so much to talk about this week. And so much we can't talk about on the first and only wrestling podcast. Well, not a good day for not a good week for WWE Hall of Famers or <laughs> WWE promoters. The mm-hmm. mm-hmm. uh, former president of the United States is uh, facing 136 years in prison. And uh, Vince McMahon. Uh, the Justice Department has asked Janelle Grant to uh, pause her lawsuit why, against Vince McMahon, WWE, and John Laurinaitis as the DOJ goes forward with their criminal investigation into allegations of sexual misconduct and sex trafficking against Vince McMahon. Yikes. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) And uh, so this is being done in the Southern District of New York, I believe. And uh, they have a pretty high conviction rate from uh, from what I have read. So there you go. Well, well, it's nice to get good news once in a while. (sighs) Um, I mean, look, we've laid out when this originally happened, we laid out all the facts of this case. We don't need to go back into it in great detail, but yeah, uh, talked about this probably maybe at that point when we talked, or maybe last year when, whenever that report came out that the feds had raided Vince's house and seized his phone and stuff uh, originally came out. Um, Feds don't do stuff like that, and they certainly don't bring charges if they don't think they can get a conviction. So, you know, fingers crossed. On a much lighter note, we're coming off a double pay-per-view weekend. WWE had their latest Saudi Arabia show. AEW had their latest Las Vegas show. And uh, what did you think of uh, WWE King and Queen of the Ring of uh, if what you saw? I thought it felt like pretty standard Saudi show feel. Um, I yeah, I thought I, I thought everything was solid. I didn't think anything was remarkable. Um, we talked about this a little bit off the air. I think Nia Jax is my favorite wrestler, at least in the World Wrestling Federation currently, um, because her matches feel a little bit different than anyone else in that company for the reason that she's one of those people where you just don't quite know what she's going to do or <laughs> if, if she's going to be able to execute the, uh, the spots that TJ Wilson or whoever's uh, or abyss or whoever is agenting her matches whips up for her to do. Um, so I feel like, that match and the the wild finish where uh, Lyra Vilkir, I'm bad at this, I'm bad at saying her name, uh, tries to power bomb her and Naya like jump, basically hops off the middle rope and sits down and uh, does like it's like doing the Yokozuna finish to a standing person, I guess. Um, it, it looked awesome, and uh, I mean Lyra wrestled on raw on monday so it doesn't seem like she was hurt at all so yeah that might be the standout thing and uh yeah otherwise uh just you know i felt like par for the course for these saudi shows i don't i almost always expect nothing and so if they're just like sort of borderline competent wrestling shows i feel like that's almost a win so cody rose retained the wwe title over logan paul Mm-hmm. Sami Zayn retained the Intercontinental title over uh, Big and uh, Chad Gable. Mm-hmm. Liv Morgan beat Becky Lynch for the Women's World Championship as they really kicked this Liv Morgan, Dominic Mysterio, the Judgment Day angle off. 
and they're still playing it as though uh, Dom is unwittingly helping Liv when very clearly that's not going to be the end result of the story. Mm-hmm. But okay. And uh, that continues to play out on Raw. And Gunther and Nia Jax are the king and queen of the ring. They did a uh, screwy finish in the Orton Gunther tournament final. And uh, as you already discussed, Nia Jax just almost literally squashed Lyra Valkyria. <laughs> There's an element of danger yes. to Nia Jax matches <laughs> that uh, her match on SmackDown against uh, Bianca was also uh, very dangerous. Mm-hmm. <sighs> When someone does a senton on you or jumps off anything of any kind of height on you, if you watch wrestlers when they're laying on the ground getting ready to take the move, you're supposed to put your arms over your rib, like over your ribs, so your ribs don't get broke. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Not a lot of that in that Bianca Belair match with <laughs> uh, with Nia Jax. I don't know if. Bianca knew how to take everything. <laughs> Good Lord. Ooh, yeah, that was a tough week. But hey, uh, that, that sets up. I guess that would mean, based on, on, on the winners, they don't get to choose which belt they challenge for. It's just whatever brand they're on. They fight I mean, for we're, that belt. We're assuming that they have decided that. <laughs> Right. I might be giving them too much credit. Um, I don't know. I th- I thought they've been building Gunther versus Cody for three years. And, yeah. uh, and now they're on different brands. So I don't know about that. And uh, Nia Jackson Bailey does seem to be the direction. So I think Nia is staying on her brand, but I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's fine. You can do. I mean, Gunther and Damian Priest, or or if Drew wins the belt, Gunther and Drew seems like. I mean, matches would probably be hard hitting and fun, but it doesn't light your world on fire as a as a program. But yeah, and it does bring up the point that you raised, which is that they they I mean, Cody and Gunther were the last two guys in the first Rumble. Cody won, and they interacted again in the Rumble this year. And felt like that was the obvious SummerSlam direction for Cody, uh, because we're we're pretty sure that Dwayne is not doing anything until next Mania, and I don't think they're going to do a Roman Cody rematch that quickly. So, yeah, it it does raise the question of what they have in store for Cody moving uh, moving past the show, if in fact Gunther ends up wrestling the the Raw champion at the pay per view at that at that SummerSlam. So yeah, they've uh they've set up their next month and a half of TV or so. And Drew is getting a shot at Damian Priest in Scotland next month. So they have that going for them, which is nice. Just and Damian Priest and Drew Mac just electrifying us <laughs> with their Damian... raw hot charisma in uh, in their promo <laughs> segment on, on Monday. All right, you've been you've been ragging on Drew for many years on this yes. program, but you're an established hater. I've I've uh, been complimentary of him more this year, but mostly only in segments involving him and Punk jabbing each other. Sure, that's fine. Um, Damian Priest is just not all that over. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's that's his uh, his in ring promos on uh, on Raw on Monday. It was just abundantly clear. It's like this guy is just not all that over, and uh, and he's he's the uh, fake world champion. So I don't know if that helps or not. Um, he's probably the second or third most over guy in his own faction, <laughs> and uh, now he's a backdrop for uh, Liv Morgan, whatever Liv Morgan and Dom Mysterio are doing. Mm-hmm. So there's that. I don't know how you fix this. Uh, your world champion is not over problem, but uh, if we end up with uh, we end up with Punk coming back, and uh, if Drew knocks off Priest, and then we get Punk and Drew, 
then uh, I think the I think we've won. Yeah, I mean that would make sense. Uh, it would be like a natural line of succession to or, or Punk comes back and costs Drew the title in Scotland, Could so be. they can they can cuck Drew uh, in his uh, home uh, global region twice, mm-hmm. and maybe he'll he'll end another pay per view singing my favorite song. <laughs> One can only hope. One can only hope he and uh, he he does another sing along after after losing uh, once again. Yeah, they could they could do that. I mean, well, that does raise the point that if Gunther is wrestling the Raw champion at SummerSlam, you would think Drew versus Punk is a SummerSlam match. So again, they could do whatever they want. It's fake. They haven't necessarily outright said that Gunther has to challenge for the Raw belt. Right. So they could they could absolutely change that to the match we were all expecting and then have Drew win the title and defend against Punk. But there is also that option that you laid out and it would also allow Punk to uh, do one of his favorite things, which is to, to just be a dick in front of a crowd that hates him. So it, it would be a win for everyone and a win for me who uh, has a perverse enjoyment of watching Drew McIntyre lose in... <laughs> in matches that he should absolutely be booked to win. Sure. So really the most interesting WWE stuff this week is the fact that uh, everybody's contract is expiring at roughly the same time. (laughs) Yeah. Everybody is, um, I think, trying to work their own angles off of this. (laughs) Feels that way. So Becky Lynch dropped the women's title to Liv Morgan on Saturday. And then on Monday, she dropped a cage match to Liv after, of course, Braun Strowman slammed a cage door on Becky's head by accident. Just like just, world class in 82. Just by accident. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, Liv and Dom got together in uh, a very LOL TNA moment. <laughs> Liv Morgan made it out with Dominic Mysterio against his will uh, in a scene that was cut off on the USA Network feed because they mistimed their show. (laughs) It did make the international feed, and then WWE had to run this out on all of their social media channels immediately after because they didn't get their big angle on TV. (laughs) So there's that, but... Uh, we know Becky Lynch's contract is reportedly up this weekend. She's reportedly not re-signed. She is reportedly taking an extended break. I We can come back to that. Mm-hmm. Uh, Natalia's contract coming up soon, apparently. Mm-hmm. And Chad Gable's contract coming up in about a week or so here. Um, feels like Natalia's trying to work an angle off this. Apparently none of these people have re-signed. That's the report. None of these people have re-signed. I don't know. Chad Gable's been like the uh, the chief antagonist on Raw for the last <laughs> two months. Right. Natalia has been all over every show, including NXT, for the last two months. And uh, Becky Lynch is Becky Lynch. And uh, her husband re-signed. And her uh, husband, who she has a child with and travels with, has resigned with the company. So, to me, the likelihood that any of these folks ends up working for another wrestling company is very, very low. The Absolutely. fact that the fact that they've let it come down to the wire like this, as far as contracts and negotiations. It feels like some weird semantic thing to me that I don't understand. Um, Do you have any insight on this? Yeah, I mean, that's kind of what we discussed with the the Drew of it all before Dwayne took to Instagram to announce his resigning. Yes. uh, Very suddenly (laughs) on like a Saturday night. Um, Yes. (laughs) Just ruin Paul's little angle. Uh, Yeah, uh, we talked about it there. It feels like I can I can believe like we I think I used this example last time, too, that like when CM Punk tells the story that he re-signed during Money in the Bank. 
I believe I can believe that pen has not officially been put to paper with any of these people yet. Um, but I can't wrap my head around the idea that WWE would be putting all of these people all over their television shows week after week. Um, thinking there was even the slightest chance that they were actually considering walking out the door and, and going somewhere else. So yeah, feels like a weird like letter of the law thing. Like, Oh, I haven't resigned. Could be that terms were agreed to in principle by both sides, but the official contract has not been, you know, signed pen has not been put to paper yet. That's certainly a possibility, but yeah, it is wild to have this happen. Like, with like you just said three or four people all at once um and yeah especially people that have been utilized a lot more i mean natty's always like the utility player <laughs> on on whatever you know she just goes where they need her and and does whatever they need her to do but like yeah becky was just the champion last week they kind of i mean she maybe has done a more specific like a alluding to the fact that she's leaving and and like her social media after the match on on monday is alluding to the fact that that was like her last match and all that so she's very clearly going to go away for a while and try to add fuel to the fire that she's that she is in fact a free agent and is considering not coming back but yeah the rest of them i don't i don't know (laughs) i guess it puts you know, it puts them in a position of some uh, authority if they don't resign and they do want to test free agency. But again, it just if that if again, if I feel like if anyone involved thought that was a possibility, then yeah, Chad wouldn't be uh, doing 20 minute segments on uh, on Raw every week and in, in one of the chief feuds that they're setting up for everything. So, yeah, I don't know. feels like a feels like a weird little game and maybe a chance to uh uh you know play with the play with the sheets a little bit i don't know to me the the test as to whether or not becky was actually going to leave was um when she put this book out under the wwe banner Mm -hmm. it's like and the book is very good and she tells the truth in the book but while still using a lot of WWE speak. Yeah. Which to me, it's like she very easily could have waited uh, two months and put this book out on her own and not use the WWE approved verbiage uh, in her book and told an even more honest story of her Mm -hmm. time in WWE if she had just waited two months. So I don't think she's going anywhere. It just, it, if you were like, I I just can't, she's just one of those people. I can't imagine (laughs) her going anywhere else. Like I can't, I can't picture in my head, even like what a theoretical, outside wwe run would look like for for becky like it's just she's well she's a and, wwe wrestler like that's and, just <laughs> right and and to that point to me the question would be more okay does she want to try to get into acting or does she go back to right. wwe not is she going to go to aew or go to the right. WWE? it's like does she want to go try to do something else it feels like, you know, if you're 36, 37 years old, maybe grinding it out and auditioning and doing those kinds of things is not in the cards at this point. Right. <laughs> right. Right. I mean, I guess the closest parallel would be like Jericho leaving to try that in whatever that was, 2005. Right. And he stayed away for about, what, 18 months or whatever. And, you know, joined the groundlings and tried to try to be an actor and whatever. And it didn't really work. And he was, <laughs> he was back in the world wrestling federation before you knew it. And I mean, he would, he would take his little breaks from there, but I don't know how many times there were where he was like completely not under contract again, but yeah, she could leave and not, you know, 
and try try to see what other opportunities are there that she could get for herself without having to ask permission from her from from the company to take time off to do like movies or tv if she thinks those uh, opportunities exist but yeah it feels like not a lot yeah not a lot of you know not that it's necessarily a fair a fair thing but yeah there's not, not a lot of women who get into acting in their mid to late 30s right well she's working an angle obviously so yes. None of this, all of this is hypothetical. Uh, Raw uh, on its own. Um, uh, I was sending you notes during the show because I know you often don't watch live on mm-hmm. Mondays. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was saying, well, right now, Chad Gable is spanking Otis <laughs> on, and that's the only thing on the USA Network right now is Chad Gable threatening to spank Otis. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then we were discussing, he's not back, is he? <laughs> It's like, you know, probably not, but there's a lot of evidence with the Otis and the spanking and the Miz and R-Truth yes. stuff all on this show and all of this. Th- there's a lot of evidence that something was happening on Monday on Raw. And I think we've de- determined, particularly with their mistiming their big angle at the end of the show, seems like Bruce Pritchard was running this taping. <laughs> I was genuinely shocked that we didn't get that note that that Paul was Paul wasn't there on uh, on Tuesday morning from Mike Johnson or we still uh, may. We don't know. Yeah, we have we haven't as of yet as of press time. We have not gotten right. the note that Paul was not there to run the show Monday. But yeah, it felt it felt like a a Vince Bruce show. And <laughs> uh, yeah, it wasn't wasn't great. We also got, you know, Braun being a big idiot. Making making Braun run around the ring, yeah, doing, doing his little steps. He can he can barely move. Yeah, and they they are asking him to sprint. It's like if you watch that. I mean, you watch it anytime he does it in a match, but specifically the one around the cage. It's like he's actually like bending the knees, trying to run when he's like at the base of the ramp. By the time he gets around the first corner, he is like sliding. <laughs> he's like barely picking his feet off the ground. He's. He's yes. just you just cannot move. Uh poor guy. And then yes, made 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 him look like a dummy and and sort of uh you know made Becky look a little foolish as a baby face as well. But hey, that's like we said, I just I expected to hear that this was a Bruce show because I think there was like one raw last year that everyone hated that like very quickly it was <laughs> It was said that Paul Levesque was not in the building because he was in he was negotiating the television deal somewhere else or something, right? As if, like when they uh, on the first, CM Punk's first Raw back in uh, yes in eleven years, ten years or whatever it was, and uh, they gave him six minutes for his big <laughs> welcome back promo because like Champa had to wrestle uh Tazawa or somebody like that at 10 <laughs> at 1050. Yeah. I feel like they did a really long gauntlet match on that show or something too. Like they just yeah it was a really weirdly Quite paced possible. show. Quite possible. Uh, but yeah it was a very weirdly paced show. And then yeah Phil got four and a half minutes. <laughs> yeah. By the time his entrance was over to to do his little shtick. But yeah that was a uh, classic. So I yeah Anyway, just not a great show, and it's fine, you know. Not every not every show is going to be a home run, but it was just so many. It just the fact that it was a weirdly paced and had a weird energy to it, and then all of these like classic WWE under Vince McMahon and Bruce Prichard style <laughs> events were occurring on this one show it was like, oh wow, okay, this definitely feels like a heavy Bruce show. <laughs> Well, uh, we'll see how the uh, WWE continues their build to their uh, next castle show. WWE Castle. (laughs) Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And AEW had a pay-per-view this past weekend as well. It's still going on right now, I think. (laughs) It's the rumor. Five years, fifth anniversary of this promotion. And... um, 
what did you think of the show? Well, stop me if you've heard this one before. <laughs> uh, it was had a lot of good wrestling on it. Uh, had a lot of fun moments. And it was also shockingly, preposterously long. <laughs> and uh, yeah. And there was at least probably three or four matches on the show that should have been on TV if if done at all and yeah. didn't belong on the pay-per-view. So stop. I know I know that's that's like saying that, you know, Raw is too long because it's three hours. Do you say that after every AEW show? But it's it's <laughs> it's unfortunately it's relevant to every almost every AEW show. And uh, this one was, I think, even by their standards, especially long because it was didn't go off the air until like twelve thirty or something. It was twelve thirty two by my by my <laughs> yeah by my watch. Yeah. So, um, legitimately, like I know that uh, God bless uh, our friends Renee and RJ and mm-hmm. Double J mm-hmm. on the uh, the the buy-in pre-show which began at 6 30 but i know the actual wrestling doesn't start till after seven Mm -hmm. but their programming began at 6 30 p.m on sunday and this show went off the air as mentioned at 12 32 on monday morning on a holiday weekend Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. this promotion has now ruined five consecutive memorial day weekends for me Actually, because of the way of it's actually six, right? This is the sixth double or nothing. Because so there's one in 19, there's one in 20, there's one in 21, there's one in 22, there's one in 23, and there was one in 24. Correct. So, uh, this is now the sixth consecutive Memorial Day weekend that they ruined of mine. And, um, and well, I have co workers that, um, ruin it too by traveling to the show every year and making me work <laughs> on my on my day off um yeah horrendous co-workers <laughs> leave that in please okay <laughs> yeah so uh i know it was actually probably more like about five hours of actual wrestling but sure. still six six hour pay per view. Uh, we don't need six hour pay per views anymore. Uh, it sucked when WWE did it five years ago. Yeah, uh, it sucks when AEW does it now, and especially if you're going to run these every six weeks or so, or if you're going to run eight or nine of these every year. I don't need a six hour show every month. If you want to do it once a year, God bless you. Knock yourself out. That if you want this, if you want all in to be your six hour show, great. If you want double or nothing to be your six hour show, great. I don't need a whole series of six hour shows. Um, yeah. Uh, we could talk about the matches, <laughs> I suppose. Sure. Uh, Deanna, Deanna, Thunder Rosa did a job on the pre show mm-hmm, mm-hmm. for Deanna Perrazzo. Uh, the acclaimed beat, uh, Brian Cage in the Gates of Agony, a match I feel like I've seen 648 times in my life. Their their new name, now that they're no longer the Mogul Embassy, is Cage of Agony. Very, very creative. Um, that f- sucks. Yeah, no, it doesn't. <laughs> uh, Will Ospreay beat Roderick Strong for the international title. This is a big week for Will Ospreay. He's uh, the uh-huh. the chief protagonist of AEW right now. Not saying he shouldn't be. He's uh, really over. He's one of the only people on the show that feels really over right now. Yep. And uh, and no one can deliver in the ring like he can. So there you go. He's uh, he's won one of the tertiary championships now. So there's that. The Bang Bang Gang kept their uh, trios titles, beating Pac. Penta and Phoenix. Um, Pac Penta and Phoenix, between the three of them, are uh, always hurt. So I don't know how you could put any championships on them. So that makes sense. Juice Robinson, your guy Juice came back. One of the true highlights of this show for me was 
him helping them win and then immediately hugging Jay White from behind and just gyrating in a very strange way while still holding on to uh to Jay White. Just immediately coming back being the biggest weirdo you can be, which as we have discussed previously is the number one way to get a uh, true wrestling stardom is to just be an absolute goddamn freak. And Juice knows that. We then uh, kind of began a series of matches that um, probably didn't need to be on this pay-per-view. Actually, I think every match I've mentioned to this point, <laughs> you could make an argument did not need to be on this pay-per-view, but uh, Tony Storm, who absolutely ended Serena Deep's career with a promo <laughs> <laughs> prior to this match on a Rampage or a Collision or something, Tony Storm cut this promo that just said, Serena Deep, you should have retired. Now I'm going to end you. Uh, the promo was 60 seconds and it ended Serena Deeb's career and then they went and did a match for, they they had worked for 15 minutes the first 10 minutes no one was into it because it was Tony Storm who's a baby face portrays a heel facing Serena Deeb who is <laughs> a natural heel it was portrayed as a baby face until like the last week of this program when they realized oh Tony Storm's the baby face. Serena Deeb is the heel. <laughs> Gosh. Anyway, they got the crowd by the last five minutes, and uh, Tony beat Serena. So Serena is dead once again. Orange Cassidy beat Trent Beretta in this feud where the guy who needs all the help in the world to get over has lost every match so far. <laughs> and the guy who's already over uh, is being dragged down by it. Uh, any thoughts on anything, any of the first six matches of this show so far? <laughs> um, I really, I really liked the Will and Roddy match. I do not care for the storyline where Will is afraid to use the Tiger Driver because it injures people, mostly because it's never really injured anyone. I mean, right. like Brian Danison got carried out on a stretcher after their match, but he was back on dynamite 12 days later or whatever. Right. Um, and wrestled in a hardcore match on the show. None, none the worse for wear from uh, by all appearances. He was back wrestling on collision within 17 days or whatever. Correct. Uh, and when he did it to Kenny Omega, Kenny, that wasn't even the finish of that match. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so. Yeah, I I guess I don't I don't get it. also it's a it's a pile driver. Pile drivers are legal maneuvers. Uh, AEW they are, yes. Right. We see them quite often. Correct. So I guess I don't understand I understand the idea is okay, there's a difference between you know wrestling to win a match and wrestling to actually injure the guy. And again, if we if he hit that move a couple times and then the guys he hit it on weren't seen for six months. Okay, that's a that's a story. But as it is, he's hit it on like two guys, one of which missed like one show before being back. Right. None the worse for wear. So I hate that also because it is one of the nine different Don Callis focused storylines that is currently <laughs> permeating all elite wrestling. Uh, and I just we've you already mentioned it. Will feels like one of the few people on the show that really has some some momentum behind him. It feels like the crowd comes alive when he comes out in a way that they don't for a lot of the other acts on the show. And associating with, the, you know, his, him being a baby face with, a, a, with an association with a heel manager who wants him to use this dead, this allegedly deadly move is uh, stupid. And it's, I don't think it helps Will. I think it hurts him, if anything. Um, and also, they already had Will wrestle all of the guys in the Don Callis family. He wrestled Takesha at the show I was at, beat him, beat yeah. Will Hobbs before he got hurt, beat yeah. the, what's his name? The guy who likes big asses, Kyle Lonnie Fletcher. Donigan. <laughs> yes, Lonnie Donigan. Um, and he's probably beaten Trent Beretta before because they were both in New Japan <laughs> at the same time. So, like, what are, like, there's no, 
the breakup when the breakup comes, he's just gonna have to run through all of those guys again. Or if not, you should just he should just next week say, Don, you're fired, and then he and Don never interact again. Like be be gone. <laughs> be gone from me. Well, also, if you can't see that Don Callis is a slime ball uh, in storyline, of course, um, then then you're an idiot. You're a right. dumb baby face. So it's like this thing where uh, Osprey's part of his faction and then he's spent a month trying to um, woo Orange Cassidy, like who should never turn heel and will never, you know, whatever. It, it's it makes the baby faces look stupid for not being able to see what everyone else could see. <laughs> right. And at the very least, it was never particularly implied that Orange was really seriously considering joining Don. Correct. But Will has. <laughs> he is. Yes. He is in the Don Cowles family. And yes. Don commentates on all of his matches. Yes. So... It's yes, it makes Will look dumb, and if anything, it hurts his aura to be around mid card dorks and a manager who can't take any bumps. So, yeah, I don't just just get just get Will away from Don and all of that stuff. If you want to do that stuff on the show somewhere, apparently, apparently, we everyone has Don Callis fever. I don't, I don't know, <laughs> it's all over these shows, and I don't get it, but. If you want to do that, that's fine. But right now, Will has momentum that nobody else in your company has, and you don't need to bog him down with a will he turn back evil by using this move that, again, is a legal maneuver that really hasn't done that much damage. Right. Um. I, yeah, I, I can't remember any of the other matches <laughs> you mentioned. Uh, it's, right. it's fine. <laughs> Trent, Trent joined oh, yeah. the Don Callis family then on Dynamite. Right. So, uh, which everyone saw coming a mile away, by the way, when Don was like, I'm going to add a new member to my family this week. I bet you think it's going to be orange. Yes, it was, it was abundant. And when it was abundantly clear that it was going to orange would not join him. And it was a setup to get Trent in. OK, so Trent's going to lose the next match, too. Like what? <laughs> I mean, that does what it feel like it is. It's like what you do when you program. I mean, you you made the comparison of Billy Gunn and The Rock. Like, like it's it's like what you do when you program a star with a guy you're trying to get over, but you don't believe in enough to let him actually beat the top guys. Right. It's so like, okay, so he'll lay him out on television a bunch, but then he loses every match. Like, that's what it feels like they're doing with Trent here. Um, but now he wears a suit, so... You know, that's that's a big change. Trent in a suit is not as bad as other examples of uh of this, but he looks like a dog wearing clothes. <laughs> um he looks, not somebody with that look that should be wearing a suit. I don't he think. looks like an an adult man who is uh who is at his mother's third wedding <laughs> <laughs> in a, when he's wearing a suit. Spoken like an adult, an adult man who's been to his mother's third wedding. <laughs> that's how I know. I know the signs. Here we go. Oh man, that's tremendous. Uh, there was a three way for the FTW title on the show with Chris Jericho, Hook, and Katsuyori Shibata. Um, this sucks. Chris Jericho needs to go home. Uh, I don't care how much Brian Alvarez tweets that he's uh. <laughs> His segments add viewers, and he's the best thing on this show. And he's having so much fun with his new character. Look, I could begrudgingly smirk or perhaps even chortle at <laughs> a thing or two that Jericho has done here as the learning tree. Sure. But is this really all that different than his obnoxious? Remember one of his WWE comebacks? He had an obnoxious babyface deal. Yeah. It's like it. It's it's not that different than the Jericho Appreciation Society Jericho, except the clothes are different. I guess he's not wearing his pink blazer every week anymore. But I he he wore a pink blazer on Dynamite this week. Did he? Oh yeah, he did. Well, there it is. It's it like it's, <laughs> and it's it feels like it's doing the same thing. It's he's coming in. Everybody knows that he's out for himself, and yet he's somehow convinced these 
young, I say in quotation marks, because I think Big Bill's like 36 years old, but he's you know, these young, impressionable wrestlers. He's he's pulling them into his under his wing, under the guys that he's helping them when really he's using them as shields to to uh, protect himself. It's like, yeah, this is this is literally this is every <laughs> heel run that Jericho has had since he came to AEW. Like it's him surrounded by a faction of nerds who take who take take a lot of bumps and lose a lot to, for him under the guise that he's helping them when it's clear he's actually very self serving. Yeah, but but he's being so meta and and you know it's it's really quite uh, it's really quite clever you know using terms like uh, TV time and and the vortex and uh and and all that he's he's being so clever by uh you know he's addressing the real life criticism of him and he's turned that into his character on television and 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 it's so subversive what he's doing right now it's definitely not just the same thing he was doing with a very slight tweak in the verbiage he uses yeah yeah jericho still needs to go home for a minimum of a year uh, mm-hmm. Preferably forever, but for minimum of a year. Yeah, we were talking with our uh, our friend and listener Mike on Twitter about this when about how Jericho used to leave and go home. Yeah, and he said, "Well, maybe it was WWE was telling him to go home." And I took sort of the alternative approach where I thought, "Well, imagine though if you stay and you're being asked to lose to Fandango, it's a lot easier to leave than." stay and you get to basically book your own stuff in perpetuity like i think that's what keeps around and i'm sure you know it's a tv rights negotiating year as you cannot go on twitter without hearing about for for any length of time and i'm sure there's a little bit of tony feeling like he needs jericho in a prominent spot on his show every week Um, i'm sure that's part of it too and that's part of what plays to Jericho, if, you know, I, you know, he's, he's, he's got to be one of the cornerstones. He's got to help. He's got to help this company survive. So he's, he's really quite selfless in what he's doing uh, when you think about it. No, like, I think that's probably part of it too. It probably plays to Jericho feeling like he's an important part of TV. And also he books his own stuff. So it's a lot more enticing and probably easier to convince him to stick around even when it feels like everyone else, including the large, uh, the audience at large, is ready to uh, see him go away for a while. Also at Double or Nothing, John Moxley beat Kaneske Takeshita, who had Don Callis in his corner, <laughs> uh, in an IWGP World Heavyweight Championship Eliminator match. Uh, Moxley was, uh, as you pointed out, taped up like a Civil War reactor. Yeah, uh, he had a very strange uh, tape job on his, one of his arms. It's just not like every wrestler who has had any kind of shoulder or arm injury for the last decade. You either wear that like Under Armour sleeve or you have that Kinesio tape all over it. And here's and here's Mox taped up like a mummy, like he's, <laughs> it's white bandages from from like his his wrist all the way up around like around his shoulder and his his pack. Like it just it looked it looked preposterous and it like then proceeded to hang off of him for half like the long strands of it like hung off of his body during his, like while he's doing his big comeback he's got this long like piece of paper attached to his arm yeah it was a regardless of the aesthetics it was just it was a bad whoever taped him up did a bad job yes <laughs> because it immediately fell apart as you pointed out but uh hey i guess in between the time that we talked about, man, did Mox make Takeshi look like a geek on Dynamite and the match where he then beat him. <laughs> they did try with an angle on collision that um, I guess some of the audience saw where Takeshi uh, tried to, to to take off Moxley's armor. So I guess they tried. Kind of. Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> right. But stop me if you've heard this before. Takeshi lost. Yep. and does not have an apparent direction. <laughs> well, 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 he's in the uh, he's in the TNT title uh, tournament now. Ah, the oh right, the, the prestigious ladder match. We, we can get to that after we talk about 
why yep. we're having a TNT ladder match. Yeah. Adam Copeland uh, beat Malachi Black by ref stoppage in a barbed wire steel cage match. <laughs> Stop me if you heard this. There was an interference in the steel cage match. Um, Adam Copeland beat Malachi Black. Adam jumped off the top of the cage and landed on his feet, broke his tibia. Which I think is your shin bone, isn't it? Uh, I believe so. Yeah. Yeah. Broke one of his shins. Uh, jumping off a cage, landing on his feet. Um, look, I appreciated uh, Adam the actor's video where he uh, addressed his injury afterwards. I thought he was, uh, I thought he spoke with candor, and um, he was he was pretty honest mm. and just explained. Uh, I've been feeling good and having a blast and I got cocky and I forgot that I'm 50 and I jumped off the cage and landed on my feet. And uh, now I have to go away for like six months. So, yeah, uh, I appreciated that. I didn't really care for this match, uh, <laughs> which came with gangrel and interference and run-ins and weapons and um, I saw someone on on uh, social media saying that Adam specifically asked for a redo of his terrible Hell in a Cell match with yes. Finn Balor. Yes. Uh, here with Malachi. Malachi kind of did a job without doing a job mm-hmm. here mm-hmm. Uh, because they gave him the out of passing out in uh, Adam's cross face or whatever. Uh, 20 minutes. And uh, what did you think? <laughs> It was too long. <laughs> um, look, they bled. They did some crazy stuff. They did stuff with barbed wire and weapons. And Adam did a ridiculous dumb dive where he got hurt. This match was not without entertainment value. I got a little bit of a kick out of Gangrel coming out and moving surprisingly well, by the way. Like, I don't know what I expected Gangrel to move like in 2024, but. You know, he hit that neck breaker and I was like, oh, all right. He could still he he didn't take a honky talk man bump, you know. He he the went muscle man, yep. Yeah, he's still uh, you know. And like for that character, him getting older and, and a little bit uglier and his hairline receding a little bit just makes him look better. So like uh, I was like, oh, okay, that's it's nice. I know like I knew that was something that Edge or Adam had said in an interview was that he really tried to get Gangrel for that WrestleMania match with Finn uh, and was told that nobody would remember it and that nobody would care. And so it seemed like this was also like a, this was him getting a make, make good payday for his buddy, which are sure. admirable. And again, crowd went crazy for it. And, and the good guys triumphed in the end. So the good guys, the vampire crew. <laughs> yes uh triumphed adam got the brood trademark what a feather in his cap uh so yeah i don't know man i like i didn't hate it as much as i've hated a lot of adam copeland matches in AEW. um but yeah i I feel bad the guy got injured but i'm not going to miss he's he's just on tv so much these last few months like He's like, he does a long wrestling match on one show and at the very least a long promo on the other. So you're getting him on Dynamite and Collision most weeks. And again, yep. I'm sure that's him. Like he said, he was having a lot of fun, you know, working with all these different people. And I'm sure, again, we saw him come out to try to do the rah-rah speech after the punk stuff. He clearly was relishing like his like kindly, kindly vet uncle, like, give me the ball, coach. I'm ready. You know, I could still... You know, I could still be a big time player here, guy. Like I, I appreciate his effort, but I, I think it's, I think it's fine that he won't be on TV for a while. <laughs> I think it's probably good that he won't be on TV for a while. Not that I would ever wish injury to be the reason why he is not on my television screen, but oh sure, I, I, I am not, I'm not going to pretend that I will miss him just because the guy got hurt, but. Yeah, when well, I mean, when it ha- the fact that he still wrestled and he didn't run, he didn't have to run, thankfully. But he still they worked for like another I don't know, like eight eight or nine minutes after after he <laughs> broke his shin. Like so, 
I mean, I guess that's that's adrenaline and and smoke and mirrors of blood and and run ins and and all of that gets you. But man, uh, you know, no one can say the guy didn't uh, didn't didn't uh, gut it out or grit it out or whatever. What's this? The grit couple. He he is one half of the grit couple after all. He is. Uh, so now he can go home and spend time with his wife. And we know that no one respects their marriage vows. <laughs> The way Adam Copeland does. Of course. <laughs> Couple of things. One uh, came to mind during this. One uh, is Adam Copeland, the new Glenn Jacobs, in that the guy goes out there and sweats and uh, and grimaces and gr- groans and grunts and has more one and three quarter to two and a quarter star <laughs> matches than anyone else in the history of wrestling. Is Adam Copeland... Has he inherited the Kane crown as far as doing the most to <laughs> to end up with a one and three quarter to two and a quarter star match? Man, that's a good analogy. I had not thought about that at all. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> <laughs> like a guy who never has a match where you're like, this is the worst thing I've ever seen. Like, it's not that level. Like, it's always competently put together. But yeah. it just goes forever, and what he's doing isn't particularly compelling. Even though you can, <laughs> as you said, you can see he's working very hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I forget my other Adam, the actor point here, but uh, yeah, that was the one that, that really struck me. It's like, oh, he is the new Glenn Jacobs. Maybe it'll come back to me. Whatever I was thinking, I had a second. I should start writing this stuff down. <laughs> All right, um, three matches. They're triple main event. If you have three main events, do you have any main events? Uh, I think you asked me this last week, and I sounds believe, like something I would do. And I believe I said the same thing, which is no. Everybody, everybody knows the whatever goes on last is the main event, and yeah, it's every wrestling company tries to do this. I was talking about this with somebody, and I said the only reason to ever do this is like is if you are contractually obligated to refer to a match as a main event like when wcw had the kiss the kiss demon who was contractually obligated to have x amount of main event matches and so they correct put him on the show second and call it a main event yes that's the only time you should ever announce a match that isn't going on last as a main event dale torborg that's right son of former major league manager jeff torborg (laughs) managed the white Sox. Maybe other teams, too. I don't know. Anyway, uh, the other th- Adam Copeland point that I wanted to bring up before we get into the triple main event here. Adam jumping off the cage was. It reminded me of the when Hogan and Piper did their cage match in WCW mm-hmm. and Macho Man climbed to the top of it. This is when WCW was still doing their wacky cage around the ring side area cage. I, yes. I don't WCW always did weird cage matches, but so Macho Man climbs up to the top of this thing in this Hogan and Piper in cage bat Hogan and Piper cage match, and he jumps off. And when he's all the way up there, I mean that thing is high, and maybe as high as this as this one that Adam jumped off of. Maybe not quite as high. I'm not sure, yeah. but because Adam was jumping into a ring and. and Savage had to clear the ringside area to get into the ring. Anyway, Savage uh, landed on his feet and blew out his knee and blew out one of his ACLs and was basically never the same again. Like he came back and wrestled here and there for a couple of years, but he was basically never the same guy again. Yeah, Um, you could argue that his entire WCW run, he was never the same guy again, but especially after he blew his knee out jumping off the cage. Uh, yeah, and then he came back and he was bigger than any <laughs> than he had ever been. He put on he decided to make up for his lack of uh mobility by packing on like 40 extra pounds of muscle. Yeah. Yeah, that didn't play well. Uh I was just going to say is so was this Adam was this was Adam Copeland's jump off the cage equal to better or worse than Macho Man jumping off the cage? It reminded me of it, too, because when Copeland jumped, I was like, "Okay, well, you can't you can't land on your feet. You can land anywhere except on your head or your feet. (laughs) 
and he didn't seem to to have a plan for how he was going to land. It's like Savage's plan was okay. Hogan and Piper are going to catch me. Right. <laughs> it's like Piper was physically shot also and had a fake hip and was also trying to sell a sleeper hold. And <laughs> it's like there's no way Roddy Piper's going to catch you. And Hogan just kind of ducked out of the way. <laughs> A instead metaphor, of trying to, perhaps, right? Instead of trying to catch his alleged best friend jumping yeah. off the cage, uh, I don't know what Adam was doing, but this reminded me of that because it was like, okay, Adam, you can land anywhere except on your head <laughs> or on your feet, and I'll be damned if he didn't land on his feet. Yeah, I, I feel like the only quote unquote safe way to do this is either you do the cross body onto the pile of guys, like you do it at the end of the match once the other guys and and Malachi and Gangrel are all standing there and you jump on all of them or you do like the superfly splash but instead he's like he's like trying to do an elbow to Malachi who's on a table and at that point your choices are come down on your hip and actually like drive your elbow into his chest or <laughs> or do what Adam did which is just kind of land next to the table uh, and on your feet. So yeah, I, I questioned the specific maneuver that he chose to try to uh, do, and the fact yes. that he did it on tried to do it onto one guy laying on the table instead of jumping onto the pile at the end of the match. But again, to his own credit, he admitted that it was stupid, and that he just was feeling he was feeling invincible. And uh, you know the the moment the moment took over. <laughs> I thoroughly enjoy when he said i just i just need to make better choices <laughs> in his explanation video it's like so say we all yeah yeah that's relatable all right triple main event mercedes monday beat willow nightingale to win the tbs title they gave willow a visual pinfall over mercedes and then uh had statlander and stokely get involved and distract the referee at the time, it seemed inadvertent, and then after the match, uh, Stokely and Chris turned on Willow, as we discussed. You know, the build for this was abundantly clear it was coming, um, and it appears that nobody in this company ever really seems to want a rematch. Um, I guess this makes sense in that they, they gave Willow a storyline reason to want to go on and uh, and get revenge on her friends who wronged her, but shouldn't when it comes time, when you're cutting the promo, shouldn't it be like, all right, well, I still want to get my TBS championship back, but first I have to deal with Stoke and Chris. Shouldn't you just, you need to do that promo and they, nobody ever does that promo in this company. They just, they get knocked out of the title picture and it's never addressed again. Anyway, yeah, that's uh, like I, I feel like that's a little endemic of like post nineteen ninety nine wrestling in general, but yes, especially sure. AEW, where it's fine. It's fine not to do automatic rematches and rematch clauses and all that stuff. It's fine uh, to not do that, but yes, it should at least be addressed um, that you lost and you're mad you lost, and specifically in her case, she's mad she lost the belt that she had just won like three weeks earlier. Right. Uh, I'm a, I'm one of Mercedes biggest fans. I'm in the, what? the I'm in the crew. Uh, I am back in the group chat. Wow. With, uh, with the, with the Mane maker herself. Mm -hmm. uh, I would, I would, uh, I would give this, uh, I don't know, maybe three and a quarter, three and a half stars. Yeah, was... uh, I I think it was a little uh, maybe a little below the bar that mentally that I had set for it, but uh, it wasn't bad by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah, no, I thought it was good. Um, maybe just because you never know how someone's going to be after not wrestling for a year. Um, I guess my expectations were a little lower for this, so maybe it exceeded mine a little bit. Um. But yeah, I thought they they had a good match. It was dramatic. Crowd crowd, I think, went a long way too. Like their work, yeah. If you if if you let these two wrestle three more times, they might have a better match all three times. But uh, I don't know if 
you'll ever capture. <clears throat> I don't know if you'll ever have a crowd that was like that crowd was invested from moment one and I think added a lot to the atmosphere of that match. And especially by the end, I mean, they were really living and dying by all those near falls and everything. So, yeah, they did a great job. They had the crowd in the beginning and they did a good job keeping it. Swerve beat Christian to keep the AEW world title. Um, I think my mind, my I just zoned out during the, <laughs> during this. I, I think might have was... been good, might have been bad. I don't know. I just I zoned out. Well, by this point, it was like eleven forty five. So, <laughs> uh, but no, I uh, I thought it was good. I think they did almost get me on one near fall for Christian. So, um, you know, they worked really hard and everybody kicked out of everything to make you think that, oh, maybe the the third time he hit the spear is going to be the time he actually wins and off the distraction or whatever. Um, so, yeah, they they tried their best. And the finish of Christian going for the spear and swerve hitting the kick at kick in midair uh, was awesome. So it was, it was good. It wasn't a match I'm going to remember but you know when we do our wonderful poll show at the end of this year and we're talking about the best match of the year mm. this is not going to be one we we speak about but uh it was it was good it was a good solid wrestling match then anarchy in the arena uh finished off this uh wonderful variety show <laughs> the elite beat team AEW which is comprised of Brian Danielson Darby Allen and FTR uh Darby did insane things um, never address why John Moxley just doesn't give a shit about AEW here. Why is Danielson the only guy in the Blackpool Combat Club that is standing up for AEW? Uh, reasons. Why hasn't John Moxley addressed the fact that his comrade is fighting for AEW's honor and he doesn't seemingly care because he's the New Japan champion now? I guess. Yeah. Uh, re- reasons. Sure. Anyway, it's because Wilds... Brian and Tony are best friends in real life and and oh. and they have a better personal relationship. Yeah, well, then let's say that. Gosh, <laughs> this isn't hard. None of this is hard and everybody tries to make it brain surgery. Mm-hmm. <laughs> anyway, uh, wild. If you like wild stunt shows, uh, I'm sure you like the anarchy in the arena. Um, I I never expect anything out of these stunt shows because. It's just not for me. I lived through the hardcore match on every show and crowd brawling on every show uh, period of the, <laughs> the late 90s and early 2000s. And this just this stuff just doesn't do anything for me anymore, but mm-hmm. I will give them credit. They came up with some creative stuff and they delivered on setting a man on fire. So <laughs> I would assume that everyone liked this. Did you like this? <laughs> if if I could try to divorce this from the fact that it was occurring after midnight Eastern time <laughs> and I was watching the show at my friend's house who uh, I live like 45 minutes away from and I kept just thinking about how long it was going to take me and the fact that I was going to have to drive at night in the woods of Pennsylvania and how I was almost certainly going to hit a deer. Um. Maybe I could have enjoyed this more than I did. <laughs> sure. Uh, as it stands, yes, it. there were memorable moments. The fire thing, Darby bled all over the place. They hung him upside down. Uh, the exploding chair or whatever with the pyrotechnics was was funny. Um, they They did like what I have to feel like it has to be the last time they ever do the music bit because they did. They played like three different people's songs. Uh, they they play in Darby's at the start, and then the Bucks grab a mic and cut it off and start playing their uh, Succession theme ripoff song, and then uh, and then Danielson cuts them off and and they play the final countdown, and that was fun, and and that was it. I felt like that injected some energy into the crowd, like the the Wild Thing song did in previous years. So uh, they may have. I don't know what else you could do. You play, I guess you could just play, keep playing more different songs next year. But I felt like, okay, that's probably the last year where this song bit will feel fun or funny to do. 
but yeah, like it's yeah, they delivered on on the brutality, and then there wasn't there wasn't like a fifth guy who ran down to help the elite win or anything. Like they they won. <laughs> They beat Darby's ass. They beat FDR's ass. Danielson tried to valiantly fight them all off. And then Jungle Jack ran in and kneed him in the face and pinned him. So, um, yeah, it was it was decisive. It was this decisive heel victory. Um, and I guess we're, you know, he, heating up uh, Jungle Jack as a, as a single star. Well, we did an angle on Dynamite where the uh, the elite teased just handing him the TNT title, and then uh, he decided uh, uh, Christopher Daniels got put in there, and uh, mm-hmm. they, yeah, Daniels is a storyline uh, authority figure now, and makes matches, and uh, he uh, set up a, a ladder match for Forbidden Door. Guys are going to have to qualify for it, though. Uh, Takeshita and Penta on Rampage on Friday at the normal time of 6.30 p.m. Eastern time. <laughs> um, uh, is the first in the series of qualifying matches. Um, last Friday's uh, Rampage at 6 p.m. Eastern time did the lowest uh, viewership in the history of the show, 222,000 people. Maybe because uh, it was on a Friday at 6 p.m. and they announced literally nothing for it on their television show on Wednesday night. Uh, if they don't care about Rampage, I don't know why I should. But, uh, oh, we didn't really talk about MJF coming back. on. This oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> and, uh, that happened. That added a 35 minutes to the show. He got a promo. He said a lot of swears. He got a bad tattoo that says uh, BFT on yourself <laughs> on his ankle. He's a big LA night mark, apparently. I mean, who isn't? Sure. But, uh People are into MJF, and as you pointed out, he may have gotten a new hairline while he was out. Yeah, hair looks darker and feels like it uh, moved up a little bit. Sure, God bless him. Um, Jack to the gills. Uh, yeah. I mean, he... He he had 10 abs. 10 abs. He was dressed as 2002 Triple H. Mm -hmm. Whatever. Uh, MJF will return to Dynamite next week where he'll kick off a program against Roosh. That actually kind of sounds... I mean, I like I like Roosh matches, so that sounds kind of fun. But maybe that's just his first TV uh, opponent on his way to whatever he does. Yeah, maybe so. Um, Roosh uh, thinks wrestling is real. Yeah, he does. <laughs> yeah, no one, no one has told him otherwise. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Although honestly, of all of these CMLL guys, he seems to be the one that has the least problem with jobbing. <laughs> it's true. It's true. He'll do uh, a job. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't. I maybe if you'd asked him to lose to like, you know, the the, the bounty hunter Brian, what's his name? Keith. Keith. I almost called him Brian Cage, but I was like, that's not right. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe he would say no to that, but he, you know, he doesn't mind losing to, you know moxley or somebody sure but anyway uh yeah they so they did the bit they had him come out and confront adam cole and adam and then they pretended like they they were friends i guess it's fine because adam cole's the heel and heels can look like idiots and adam cole's uh heel faction is now the number three heel faction in this company anyway sure so uh you might as well just make them buffoons but yes for some reason, Adam Cole tried to hug MJF and then was caught off guard when MJF punted him in the balls. But also, uh, MJF is not, or Adam is not cleared to wrestle yet, apparently. Uh, so we still aren't actually getting the resolution to that angle that uh, what was like the entire second half of the year for AEW last year. So, uh, but uh, MJF said he's not going to do comedy this time. That was his. He had a lot of insidery stuff about how he's not doing. Uh, he's not going to do all the stuff that the podcasters complained about when he was the champion last year. Yeah. So uh, we have that to look forward to. They are uh, they're building towards Forbidden Door. Uh, Will Ospreay is going to be wrestling for the world title on that show. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that means it's the end of uh, Swerve's reign already, because I assume Will is... I don't know. I would have thought Will would have been winning the title at all in at Wembley. And uh, 
maybe they want him to go into Wembley as champ. I don't know. Well, I mean, you you have time because they announced that the winner of the Owen Hart tournament is getting the title shot at all in. So swear, uh, did they say that that kicks off after Forbidden Door, right? Uh, sorry, what was the question? <laughs> Well, I'm trying to figure out if Will could lose the swerve at Forbidden Door and then they could and then he could win the Owen Hart tournament and get the title shot at Wembley and win there. The the fine yeah, I guess it's possible. The finals of uh of uh, Okay, so Forbidden Door is June thirtieth and the Owen Hart finals are July tenth. Okay, so it would have to be like a two week tournament if they were going to do that. Yeah. Which is possible. Sure. They have nine hours of television. They could they could do a lot of tournament match. I mean, if you do whatever four matches on each on each side of a bracket, you can right. you'd spread that out between a dynamite and rampage and whatever, however many shows you would have in that time period. Yeah. So you could do yeah. that. So Will doesn't have to win here, but again, he is he does feel like the hottest star in the company. So it, it would be maybe a little bit surprising to it feels like it's not time to beat either guy, but I guess if it were me, I would have Swerve win here because it feels like he would need that. It just feels like if you do, if you beat Swerve immediately, that's the end of him ever being a top guy here, which maybe their booking of him since he's been the champion has already hurt him a little bit. But if he just hands the belt right to Will here on this show, I think that would be a kind of a nail in his coffin. Well, we'll certainly find out. Uh, I'm looking at social media and seeing Mercedes Monet drinking George Clooney's tequila with Orange Cassidy. What a world! It's lovely. Uh, was Bailey at uh, at at her match? She was. Of course, she was. I shouldn't have even had to ask. Bailey, who flew. Bailey was uh, chronicling her trip to Saudi on her social media last week and she's like uh, it took me 31 hours to get from her door in the san francisco area to Saudi, to her hotel in saudi arabia it took 31 <laughs> hours Jeez. she wrestled on the on the smackdown on friday and then was in las vegas on uh sunday night for the show we should all be so lucky as to have a friend like bailey yeah, that's uh, that's wild. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if Trinity was there or not. I haven't seen any Trinity stuff, mm. but uh, pa- yeah, pa- Pam was there. Yeah, so that's 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 pretty cool. Yeah, we would. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that is that yep. is a commitment to uh, to friendship. That is quite admirable. Yep. 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 All right, we have uh, we've covered the globe. Uh, Osprey's also defending the international title on Collision this weekend against uh, uh, what's his name, Lon Yon again, Kyle O'Reilly. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, hey, I can think of worse things than to build like three storylines on your show around Will Osprey, but uh, particularly the, this version of Osprey that's super over with the audience. Uh, but uh, that that's what they decided to do is uh, yeah. they're they're tripling down on Will Osprey and um, apparently they've uh, <laughs> Tony Khan had to rewrite Dynamite a lot this week is the story going <laughs> around because uh, because Adam Copeland got hurt I guess otherwise Adam Copeland would have been in like eleven segments on Dynamite <laughs> I don't know um, there's was Adam Copeland what... going to be involved in the Mariah May Soraya match that suddenly that was av- advertised for a few days before the show and then didn't happen. <laughs> That's an interesting one, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Uh, Soraya was going to wrestle Mariah May. They advertised it. Um, then it was pulled. Now it's been re-advertised for next week. Soraya had a, a, a social media post since deleted saying she's really going to start speaking her mind now. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know what that means. I don't know if uh, I don't know if she was the one that was going to be doing a job and uh, was upset about it, or if her opponent was asked to do a job and her opponent came down with, with the flu or something. I don't know. 
Uh, Stokely Hathaway also cut a promo about some of the men in the locker room being bitches for not showing up to work with sinus infections. Mm -hmm. Um, And Tony Khan is just rewriting. Apparently, he changed the match order of of Double or Nothing 100 times a day of the show. Um, Look, the guy has several full-time jobs, Mm -hmm. and um, I don't want to be an apologist for the guy. (laughs) Is it shocking that there's a lot of rewrites when you have this many moving parts for a live television show every week? Uh, to me, it's not that shocking. Um, it is like uh, it is funny though that like this this guy who was going to do thing run a wrestling company the smart way and mm-hmm. and all of that. Guess what? He's also now a victim of the content monster, where yeah. you have he has two hours of dynamite, two hours of collision, an hour of rampage. Uh, an hour of ROH and some weeks, uh, six hours of pay-per-view time as well uh, to try to program every week and people don't make their flights and people get sick and people get hurt and he is jobs. No one wants to do a a freaking job (laughs) and uh, and he's got to rewrite stuff on the fly and he changes his mind and hey, he's also a victim of the content monster. It's just sure. I don't know with as much product as everybody has. I don't know how you can't be today. I mean, I, 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 anyway, it's just not surprising to me. No, I, yeah, I, like I said, it's funny to point out when, yes, that was very much a hallmark of Vince McMahon era world wrestling federation of, you know, 10 minutes before the show and he tore up the whole script and wanted to rewrite it. And that's, and then Raw would be on the air and it would be the exact same show <laughs> almost beat for beat that they'd been doing for the last 12 straight weeks. Probably right. because he couldn't, he also can't remember anything. So right. he ends up just booking the same things he booked the previous week anyway, the same matches and whatever. Um, so yeah, like it can, yeah, it happens. Most, <laughs> I feel like there's at least a period of every person that's that books wrestling at a high level for any length of time where you're like, yeah, they were just, they were just going, you know, they're just going a little bit out of their mind and they were, they were really second guessing everything and they were changing things at the last minute. Like, yeah, I feel like you, you probably hear stories about that with Paul Heyman. You can hear stories about that with certainly with Eric Bischoff, like, and, and Eric wasn't even really like in the weeds on creative the way that Tony seems to be or, or that Vince right. was for all those years or that Paul Levesque is now right. like, so it's like, yeah, it, it happens. Like you said, it, it, it happens eventually. And it's and this current model of how professional wrestling is produced is even more subject to that based on, like you said, just the amount of time and uh, every week that you are contractually obligated to fulfill uh, every week. Well, that's, uh, that's certainly a lot. Tony Khan has a, uh... I don't know. The uh the post double or nothing media scrum was even more useless than usual. <laughs> um it's just like a, it's like a series of skits. Uh, I I don't know. But there were even fewer real questions asked and answered at this one than uh, than usual. Anyway, uh, a lot of talk that uh, about um uh AEW's offer on the table from WBD for a Contract renewal, whether Tony Khan's disappointed about it or not, they haven't signed it, so maybe there's your answer. Sure. Uh, but why yeah. you would not want to wait until your exclusive negotiating period's over so you could listen to all bidders, I don't know. I don't know. This right. is all above my head. I've never, I've never negotiated the TV network before. Uh, I, Brave I, of you to admit that, but thank you. Uh, I, I think it's fine. Like, I think yeah. all this is fine. I think they're going to get a big extension. I think they're going to get north of a hundred million dollars a year. I think they're going to be very profitable. Everything's fine. <laughs> there are no problems. Um, but it is interesting to watch all of this kind of unfold. Yeah, I mean, the only if the idea is, OK, WB, WBD made their offer during this window 
and Tony is not accepting it because he thinks he can get more out of them once the exclusive window is over. It's like, well, that's only a bad idea if you if you think there's a chance that like they're going to get mad and change their minds and take the your existing offer off the table. <laughs> um, right. So, yeah, there's no reason to not like there's no reason to jump in and accept the first offer you have unless you have reason to suspect that not accepting it will hurt you in a long time. And again, there are limited outside partners that you can negotiate with who don't already have a WWE deal. <laughs> right. Um, you know, like, right. As we've talked about, like two conglomerates, conglomerates own most of cable now. <laughs> Correct. So it's like, okay, there aren't that many places they could go. I guess Viacom and Viacom streaming or, uh, you know, Amazon. Like, I don't know. Like there aren't that many places that they, they could really negotiate with on like traditional television, so, but there's no reason not to hear those offers either. So yeah, right. it's, I think it's a lot of like, it, it creates a lot of content for the, for the wonderful folks, uh, who make a living uh, doing YouTube videos with a funny picture of Tony Khan in the thumbnail. So as long as we're, as long as we're helping support that, uh, that industry, I think that's all that matters. All right. Uh, Jordan Grace from uh, impact showed up on NXT this week. She's wrestling the women's champion Roxanne Perez at their mm -hmm. pay-per-view next Sunday. Uh, always kind of notable when, uh, when, WWE decides to work with anyone outside uh, their own walls. Uh, Jordan Grace has about a year left on her impact contract. Um, I mean, I don't know what TNA gets out of this. I know what WWE gets out of this. They get Jordan Grace on their TV for a year before they sign her. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Unclear to me what exactly uh, impact gains from this. Uh, and Ethan Page uh, debuted in NXT this week and is uh, going after the world champion there. Ethan Page, um, as I've maybe mentioned on the show before, I see him as a as a fellow that people seem to like because he's polite and rarely late. <laughs> uh, I'm sure he's a very nice man. He was also a guy who was around on the indie scene forever. No one ever signed him. Uh, he finally got a, a look and impact. He finally made it to AEW. He couldn't get off the bench in AEW in a time when their entire roster got injured. Yeah. He still couldn't get off the bench. He couldn't even make it in this new version of Ring of Honor. <laughs> and yeah, now, he, now he had he's a wonderful in program with one of Mark Sterling's guys in Ring of Honor, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, he did. He he had a, a nice match with Omega uh, in Montreal on oh, TV right. yeah. uh, last December. Or whatever. Probably his just... last AEW <laughs> appearance. I think it was. Yeah, I think he might have done one Ring of Honor show after that. But yeah, I mean, that was basically it for him. Um, I mean, I don't know. Like, not everybody's a made eventer. Yeah, uh, I don't think he's a made eventer. I don't. I think he's a meh talent. I'm sure he's a very nice man. I'm glad he has a job with the biggest company in the world, wrestling company in the world now. Good for him. Yeah, it seems like a Cody guy, too. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of Cody guys. Uh, deals either coming up or about to come up. <laughs> mm -hmm. Cody was talking very recently about how when he was in a segment with Logan Paul, he missed having a manager. And then Arn Anderson announced this week that his AEW contract is about to end. Probably a coincidence. Probably not a coincidence. Uh, I just, I don't see Arn Anderson as a... Well, they got Paul Ellering out there every week. I guess. Paul Ellering is... Uh, <laughs> a, looks like a man who was turned into a frog who was turned back into a man. <laughs> I think you've used that line before, so I'm just ripping you off. But I think I, think I said he looked like a Muppet that got turned into a man. So that... Yeah. The man who got turned into a frog who got turned back into a man. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, he does. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. It just seems like... And, hey, Cody as the the top guy currently, using using that ability to get guys like Sean Spears and Ethan Page a shot in NXT. And if they get really over, great. 
And if they're just there to be player coaches who work with, you know, who, you know, help teach these former football players how to work on live television every week. Well, that's not the worst gig in the world you could have either. So, there's, yeah, there's value in that also. I'm I'm not saying he's he's a totally worthless hire. No, <laughs> just just saying I don't I don't see it anyway. It's very brave of you to say that he's not totally worthless. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. No one has ever denied my bravery. All right. Okay. We've uh, talked about a lot of stuff here. Uh, is there anything else you want to get into? You feel like our shows are getting longer. <laughs> sure feels that way, doesn't it? <laughs> I feel like we used to be like really tight, like 45 minutes most. Yes. And we're we're like we're like closer to like hour 10 to like hour 30 a lot of weeks now. Well, this was a double pay-per-view week, so that's true. There was a lot to talk about, as as you said at the start yeah. of the show. Yeah, but uh, but to your point, yeah, maybe I should uh, maybe I should just shut up. <laughs> that wasn't the implication. It's just a it's just a, a thing I've been thinking about. But I haven't heard the listener complain, so hopefully they enjoy these uh, these extra extra long episodes we've been bringing out recently. We should probably take next week off, though. Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. All right. So uh, we'll be back in a couple weeks, everybody. Till then, I'm Ethan. And I'm Liam. We'll be back soon with more stories from the wrestling life. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Now, here are this week's bonus features. Ladies and gentlemen, we got him. <laughs> See how old Donny Trump wrinkles his way out of this one. I'm trying to just enjoy it, you know, for the sure. general bit that you know he's never been madder in his whole life. Sure. Um, and sometimes the only joy and only justice you can find uh, for someone that rich and powerful, as we may or may not discuss in the main show, uh, is public humiliation and, uh, you know, momentary disruption of their regular, very cushy, uh, easy lives. So trying to enjoy that part of it. But boy, I, I don't have it in me to like celebrate about it. I think that uh, I don't think that part of uh, part of me exists anymore. But you know, good for good for anyone who can muster up, uh, you know, some real real excitement about this, or you know, anger on the other side of it. You know, I just both guys are just gonna fundraise off it. It's fine. <laughs> what does it matter? <laughs> what kind of uh, sentencing is he facing here? I don't even know. Each of Trump's felony charges carries a maximum sentence of four years in prison. But well, there, well, there you go. Seems, but there's a wide variety of things the judge could choose to discipline him with, besides jail time, which I assume that's how this ends, right? He he pays a fine, or they tell him to pay a fine, and he just doesn't. <laughs> Yeah, I honestly am not paying a whole lot of attention to this just because I like think it's abundantly clear that nothing's going to come of it, even if he's <laughs> just because old Donnie Trump has wiggled his way out of everything so far. And uh, the likelihood of him facing 136 years in prison for uh, falsifying some business records for a $150,000 hush money payment seems uh, unlikely to me. But uh, what do I know? Yeah, no, it's like I said, you just just take it for the the win in that a person you don't like is being humiliated publicly. That's that's the win here. That's the only win <laughs> that we uh, that anybody who is not a fan of his is getting out should expect to get out. Of. I try to keep on keeping on.